So I'm going to try to, to tie some of these different ideas together under this uh, umbrella that I operate in, which is the learning management system, which is you know, really broadly used technology by teachers, faculty, professors, and of course their students. Um, and, and I'm a reading nerd, and one of the things that's really rewarding to me as a parent is to see my own kids read. And it's not just because I love reading, but it's because when I see kids read, they tend to read very, very intensely. Right? They often have a few books that they read over and over again, or they, they have me read over and over again. And, and I see that contrast to how I read these days, which is what we might call hyper-extensively. And one of the books that um, my, my two little kids love is called Zen Shorts by a man named John Muth. And there's a story in there called The Farmer's Luck, which you, you may have heard before. It comes from the Taoist tradition. And in this story, uh, a farmer loses his horse, and his neighbor says, oh, such bad luck. But the next day, the horse comes back, and it brings with it 12 additional horses, and the neighbor says, that's really good luck. And the farmer says, maybe. And the farmer's son rides one of the new wild horses, falls off and breaks his leg, and the neighbor says, oh, such bad luck. And the farmer says, maybe, because the next day, the army comes to town looking for recruits, and his son's leg is broken, so he can't join. Such good luck, right? Maybe. So this, you know, this can go on and on and on. But I, but I think about this in context of what we do at Canvas, which is software development. Now, thankfully, um, software development isn't so dependent on luck. But that roller coaster that the neighbor goes through, the up and the down, is it good, is it bad? It's something that we sometimes feel on the product end as we develop and design new features. Uh, now Canvas, a learning management system, that means it's a broad suite of tools used by faculty to deliver content, to engage with students, to assess activities, uh, a full range of different things. And one of the things that it does is it enables you as a teacher to create an announcement to your students. Now in Canvas, the announcement's really just a kind of discussion post. And by default in Canvas, we designed it so that users can comment on the teacher's discussion. And that's been since day one. One of our product managers heard, though, from faculty who teach very large courses that this is dumb. They said, I've got 300 students. When I post an announcement, it's a one-way transmission. No student should be able to respond to that. That's just distracting for me when I have dozens of students responding to what I mean to be a one-way transmission of information. So the product manager who heard this feedback said, yeah, that is, that is kind of dumb. That's what discussions are for, right? So he, he kept the feature to allow students to, to comment, but he turned it off by default. He turned it off by default. And as we announced this to our community, uh, not only I, but other instructors as well said, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. By turning the default to off, you've actually changed the dynamic in my course. My course is one where I want to hear students' voices. My course is one where oftentimes I create an announcement and it's not 100% complete. And so I have students who are going to message me through the private communication tool and say, you know, what about this, what about that? And I'm going to have to either reply to them individually or make a new announcement to clarify for the rest of the class. So this is one of those cases where our default was to be a little bit open for the students, allow and in fact encourage students to express their voice and to interact, uh, but that doesn't always fit everybody's worldview. And so, as, as Jeremy mentioned, you know, Canvas, amongst a number of different learning management systems, um, has been pretty successful in the higher ed market. So this is our, our growth over time in terms of the number of institutions uh, that are using Canvas. So it's fantastic. And, and I like to believe that some of that success is based upon our default to student empowerment. But a lot of it, we know, is based upon ease of use and flexibility. And, as we hear from institutions, openness. So I'm going to talk about openness here and, and hopefully get to a point where you guys think about the role of the LMS and its ability to engage with materials, resources, people, and technology outside of its 
uh, sort of walls, as was said before, the walled garden. So when we look at how faculty use technology like an LMS on a given campus, and, and this idea um, you know, comes from my own experience in faculty development uh, at Utah Valley University, we can kind of categorize faculty into a number of different groups, going out from the middle in terms of how much they use a technology like the LMS. You know, we start with our core users, those who, who probably use it for online or blended courses. Um, but going out, you know, you can see going to the left, you've got folks who might just use it to post a syllabus or share some PowerPoint slides, and folks on the far left uh, who just choose not to use the technology at all. They just don't like it, and, and oftentimes for good reasons, don't get me wrong. Looking uh, toward the right, though, you're going to find folks who use the LMS to some degree in combination with other technology, like maybe their publisher, uh, the publisher of their textbook, provides them with an EPACT or a digital site that they want to use as well. And in often, oftentimes, the LMS is then sort of a gateway to those other tools or technologies. And then on the far end, you've got folks who also reject the, uh, the technology like the LMS in favor of their own tools, real-world tools. And you know, as opposed to just wanting to get everybody into using the LMS deeper and deeper, um, we took the approach of saying, Yes, it should be easy and flexible and add enough value and reward users so that they do take advantage of it for the sake of their students. But that doesn't mean that we don't want to work with external tools and services. And it doesn't mean that there's not a way for us to reach outside the walls of the LMS and engage with a great variety, an increasingly broad variety of technologies that, that help learning. So um, over the years, and I've been with Canvas uh, almost seven years now, we've managed, we've managed to kind of maintain our core philosophy that this technology should be open, and in fact open by default. Now that doesn't mean it's completely open, that doesn't mean it's always open, but that it, it, it does default to openness, and we see some great advantages both in terms of who's willing to use the LMS and what value they get out of it, but also in terms of the kinds of innovations that have been talked about here today already in terms of getting outside tools, services integrated with the LMS. So when we talk about openness, um, one of the things that we've, we've believed from the beginning is that, uh, that the web, the open web, is still not only the best learning object repository on the planet, but also, also the best place to find cool technology and real world tools. So, you know, getting outside websites into the LMS is not hard. Um, one of the things, though, that is, is kind of cool is Canvas itself operates like a website. Now, by default, talking about defaults, uh, a Canvas course site is going to be closed to the public, but the content can be opened up. You can toggle that as being open. Regardless, you know, we use kind of a normal uh, URL structure so that you can just use tools that you already have in your browser, like Hypothesis, with Canvas. That actually saves us a, a ton of effort because when somebody says, hey, why don't you build in student note taking or annotation into Canvas, we can say, why would we when there's already a great tool out there like Hypothesis? So that, that sort of stuff just works. Um, it goes the other way too, and this is one of those things that really attracted me to Canvas in the beginning as an open educator. Uh, that's the idea that some of the core tools that teachers want an LMS to do, like collect student submissions and provide them a way to give some private feedback and even engage with students on a given piece of work, that can happen, but it doesn't have to just be through a file that a student uploads. Right. Here you're seeing a snapshot of a Wikipedia page that a student submitted because Canvas supports, it's very simple, URL-based assignments. And so the faculty member gets to see the website that the student submitted at that point in time, and you can see the hyperlink to the live version as well, but still have all of the tools that they would hope that the LMS provides in terms of scoring and rubrics and comments and, and, um, and annotation. We also support open standards, and Steele talked about uh, a number of standards, Caliper being one of them, LTI being another. LTI is really the, the key, standards that, uh, key standard that we rely upon today 
for ensuring that tools outside of the LMS play nicely within these walls. So here you're actually seeing the Hypothesis LTI tool in Canvas. Um, this does a number of different things. One of the things that it, it does is when you uh, link out to an external URL, the Hypothesis annotation tools are just automatically available for students to use. So LTI is a great standard whereby uh, somebody who's not affiliated with Canvas or any other LMS can build a tool once that's going to work across different LMSs and create a seamless experience for, for the students. Um, but that's oftentimes not enough. One of the things that we've found super valuable for individual technologists, institutions that want to innovate with technology on their own is having an open API. Now an open API, you can think of it like cupboards inside of a, of a kitchen where you can open up a cupboard and pull something out. You pull some data out of, the, out of Canvas, right? Or you open another cupboard and you put something in. You put some data into Canvas. Uh, so the, the API basically gives a user or a technologist access to the data from Canvas, both taking it out and putting it back in, right? And, and one of the ways to best understand this is by thinking about a mobile app. So Canvas has mobile apps for iOS and Android. Those aren't just responsive design in terms of the website, right? Those are actually native applications that use our open API to make hundreds and hundreds of calls back and forth based upon your credentials to get information and represent that on your mobile device. Now, this, the thing that you're seeing here on the screen right here is, uh, is an LTI tool that uses our open API built by Northwestern University. And they call it Nebula. There were a couple of professors at Northwestern who were using Canvas, and it was, it was all right. They were using discussion forums. Uh, and students were responding in the discussion forums, but what these professors were not seeing was the kind of student-to-student -student interaction that they really hoped to foster in their classroom community. And they, they hypothesized that this was possibly because a discussion forum is very linear, top to bottom, right? And you have the nesting and the threading, but it's very linear top to bottom, and students are oriented to the topmost post, which is the instructors. So of course they're going to respond to the instructor because that's what they're expected to do. So what they started is, uh, what they started doing is pulling data out of Canvas and using what's called social network analysis to visualize how students are interacting with each other and with the instructor. And they certainly saw patterns that suggested, yes, students are primarily just responding to the teacher. But while they were looking at this visualization of discussion forum uh, interactions, somebody had the bright idea of saying, well, if we can visualize this data from the Canvas API, um, couldn't we also just create a new user interface for the Canvas discussions? One that isn't linear, but is in fact the social network analysis itself? So instead of just looking at how students are interacting in this particular view, what if this were the mode through which students interacted with the discussions? So that's what they built. This is, uh, this is a replacement for the Canvas default user interface for discussions, one that's based on the, the uh, hub and spoke model of social network interaction. And they saw that not only did this increase the quality of student posts, but, but it also accomplished their goal of increasing the frequency with which students were interacting with each other as opposed to just replying to the faculty member. So this is a kind of exciting example of uh, a number of different projects that happen across the Canvas community whereby they're building their own innovations, they're building their own versions of Canvas tools or plugging into Canvas in, in cool and different ways. Um, and they're thinking about, you know, how do we get technology to adapt to what we, you know, how do, we, I'm sorry, how do, we, how do we get educational technology to adapt to the cultural changes driven by technology out in the rest of the world? And so to come back to, uh, to, to digital reading and annotation, we know that how people read in the world is changing. You can see in, in this particular picture, nearly all of these people are looking at something on their phone as they're 
crossing a road, which is probably super dangerous. Uh, but it's, it's a habit for us now, and I think it's reflected in how we read, uh, how we engage with texts, and that carries over from the reading that we do outside of the classroom to the reading that we do inside of the classroom as well. So there's a lot of changes happening um, in society and in how we engage with information that I think educators need to uh, take note of and begin to adapt to. What I like in Hi Howard Rheingold's quote here is that it acknowledges that the change we are in the middle of isn't minor and isn't optional, uh, but it also suggests that it's not set in stone. We have ways of influencing it, of controlling it, and perhaps diverting it. And, and we believe at Canvas that one of the ways that we can help figure out what the best, path, best paths forward are for educational technology is through openness and by enabling folks and encouraging folks to, um, to begin to play around with you know, not only what's possible within the LMS, but outside of the LMS and how do we cross the boundaries back and forth. So I know tomorrow is hack day. Uh, I just want to plug the Canvas API, which is open and available for experimentation. And I, and I hope the Hypothesis guys don't mind. That's the GitHub address for Hypothesis as well. Uh, because there are really a lot of cool things that have been done in terms of the Canvas app or, uh, from Hypothesis, but a lot of things that could be done as well to lower the barrier for faculty and students to begin engaging in more active reading stemming from perhaps the LMS, but extending further beyond. Thank you. Any questions for Jared as we bring this to a close? People may be a little tired. <laughs> Last ideas, last thoughts? Wow, even Remy doesn't have anything to say. That's pretty, that's amazing. <laughs> Let me, oh, ooh, thanks Heather, sorry. Oh, uh, right in my face, okay. I really appreciated your conclusion. Uh, I love Ryan Gold's work. Um, I think his observation, and perhaps observations that many of us have made here over the past few days, concerns these changing media practices. You mentioned changing reading practices in particular, and I'm curious from your, your stance, both professionally at Canvas right now, but also somebody who has you know, years of experience you know, developing and using educational technologies, maybe more broadly how you see changing everyday media practices, just changing the way that we even choose to pick up and use educational technology or any kind of learning technology more broadly. Mm -hmm. It seems like that's a, there's a bit of a kind of you know, horse and cart dynamic there. Yeah. And, I, and I wonder how the rigidity of learning technology design historically, I'm not suggesting that that's what you're doing, obviously given what you've presented, but the rigidity of some design may or may not be responsive to changing everyday media practices. Yeah, I, I, I think, uh, well, let me, let me approach that two different ways. On the one hand, well, okay, so massive open online courses. Who's familiar with those? Massive open online courses, right? Uh, those have a very low completion rate. They are designed to be r fairly formal academic experiences. Uh, they're designed by university professors oftentimes. Uh, they're targeted at a much broader audience, and they have very low completion rates. And I think one of the reasons why that's true, as, a, as opposed to students who enroll in a traditional course, is that there's less, of, there's less of that, even though it might be designed as a formal learning experience, there's less of that sense of formal obligation, of commitment to those courses. And so I think, on the one hand, one of the advantages that, uh, that you have working in a more formal learning environment, whether that's an LMS or a face-to-face -face classroom, is that there are still certain expectations from the student as to how they're going to behave, how they're going to interact, that this is an educational textbook, this is an educational lecture, this is an educational discussion, and there are certain ways in which we are supposed to interact and mediate in order to achieve our outcomes. Um, Having said that, I think it's probably impossible 
to protect those kinds of experiences forever. And I imagine that those of you who teach today do see that carrying over. I've, I've certainly heard that anecdotally from professors who say, you know, it's just hard to get my students' attention in the face-to-face -face classroom these days, so I'm gonna start teaching online because at least I'll know that when they log in, they're ready to learn. Whereas just arbitrarily pulling them together in the classroom at a, at a certain time uh, doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to give me their attention. Uh, so, you know, on, on the one hand, I think educational experiences still have sort of that protection or that uh, expectation that we're going to consume or interact in a certain way, uh, but, but that's probably changing rapidly. In terms of the rigidity of technology and, and technology's ability to adapt to, uh, you know, these, these broader cultural uh, changes in terms of how we consume information and engage with each other. Y yeah, historically we've, we've certainly seen that educational technology vendors, I mean I, I won't exclude us from that, have been slow to adapt, but uh, I would argue that oftentimes that's merely a reflection of what the majority of faculty and instructors want to see in those technologies. Uh, whether they are, they are intentionally resisting the changes that they see outside of the classroom, or this is the way that we've always done things, so, so why would it change? All right. I, well. I have a question. Okay, go for it. Um, so I, to, having you know, helped store the Hypothesis uh, Canvas app over the past few years, I think I can attest from sort of secondhand experience looking over the shoulders of developers that the open API and other open aspects of, of Canvas have certainly made our work a lot easier and made the app as it functions currently within Canvas superior to other LMSs. They're just, our APIs aren't open in Blackboard, cool. for example, in the same way, so we just can't do some of the same things. Um, but I'm curious if you have any thoughts just about the, so you said at some point, like, you know, third-party app like Hypothesis, adds value to the LMS as a platform, right? And all the third-party apps and the ability to plug them in so easily for an instructor adds tremendous value, right? Yeah. And I just want to hear you sort of articulate how you think the partner program that you guys have with those third-party developers, uh, app developers, and, and how you partner with uh, third-party app developers like us, how, what that business model, how it distributes the sort of, uh, what is model for distribution both of revenue and of I guess attention, how, how, how you guys came up with it or how you sort yeah. of explain yeah. it. So to, to summarize, you know, how, do we, how do we go about our partner program and um, you know, what value does that hold for our company and for our users, so to speak? Okay. Yeah, and for the third party app developers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so we, we have a partner program whereby uh, we invite anybody who builds any kind of technology uh, to participate for free, right? And um, participation means that you know you're a partner, and and your uh, application is available on our EduApp Center, so that faculty faculty who might be browsing for different tools that the LMS plugs out to can find you, learn about you, and and pretty simply with just one or two clicks, uh, get you into their course. So on the one hand as I said before, in the case of the partners program, we default to openness. We want it to be an open ecosystem where everybody can participate. Uh, there, there is a part of the partner program whereby we look for uh, technologies or companies that we would deem a strategic partner, whereby we would say, okay, we know that this technology is robust and reliable and demanded by um, you know, a great proportion of our users that we, we really want to take, go the extra step and make sure that that's available to everybody and that, um, not that it has our, our seal of approval necessarily, but, but something like that, where, whereby we say, we, we attest to the value of this beyond just being a member of this open ecosystem. Um, and, you know, that's not something that we, we, we do necessarily based on commercial value of a, a given product or, or a, a vendor's company. But, but really based upon the strategic value that it provides to the Canvas platform, right? If it's something that we don't want to build, but, but you do it, let's, let's make that more strategic. Um, or, you know, based on user demand. I do not know if that answers the question completely, Jeremy. Oh, a couple more questions. It's 
So I'm at a place that just adapted Canvas two years ago now, and one thing that I have seen, so I went my first quarter uh, and tried to break as much of it as I could, uh, and like just push the limits of what it is, and then I'll tell my colleagues, like, oh, did you know you can do this? Mm. And they'll be like, no, mm. I didn't know. Um, and I know that the support community is really ro robust, it's super, like the upvoting and all that, um, but I'm wondering if you, have how to get people to adapt or leverage yeah. features that they don't know are there and they're like i'm a luddite i can't i just use it as a place to put up the pdfs um yeah. and get them to my students i'd have a discussion board like what are ways that you found that are successful um because no one ever shows up to those uh, formal trainings yeah. Yeah. wow wow uh such such a interesting question because you know on the one hand we would love to build the technology in such a way that it opens doors for users to do more and i think um, in some parts of canvas we've been successful at at sort of unlocking door after door after door so that if you do one thing then another thing is is apparent to you but but um, certainly that's not the case throughout the system, and a, a really good example of that would be, you know, if you use Canvas, did you know that there is a Canvas skill for Alexa? And, and most people are like, no, I didn't, I didn't know that. So, you know, with a growing number of features of increasing depth, how do you, how do you invite users to try those out, and how do you reward users for um, making good use of those? I actually think that's the biggest problem that we at Canvas face over the next five to 10 years. And, and I think it's solvable. And I think um, you know, a lot of folks talk about data and analytics and even artificial intelligence uh, and the, the potential impact that that has on learning. I think of those things as being much more valuable in terms of helping an individual understand how to make the most of the technology that's in front of them without having to you know, read through all the documentation or the tutorials or the guides, right? So I don't have a good answer for that, except um, you know, historically, communities and, and networking is very, very powerful. You know, the, uh, the diffusion of innovation happens by hearing from people that you know and trust uh, that something is possible and that something works for you. Uh, we certainly will continue to try to find ways to design the technology to invite folks to go deeper or broader. Uh, but I think long term, the answer is going to be by making analytics on the back end, understand who you are, what you want to accomplish, and then finding the right times or moments during your user experience to invite you to do something else. And I think that works for both teachers and students. There's another question here I'd love to, I'd love to answer if we have time. So I, uh, hang on, what, I, I, I worked on the uh, initial hypothesis prototype for the LTI app and going into that project, what I knew about the LMS was that it was bad and that yeah. it was a walled garden because right? yeah. it was received wisdom amongst, I mean, I'm not an educator, but I have a bunch of tech friends. So that's what I knew, yeah. right? And um, what I found was, was shockingly different, right? I found that, that in particular LTI uh, was, was both simpler and more radically open than I had ever been led to believe. Uh, and uh, my question is, I, I'm sure that you battle that perception mm. um, every day. Um, what, what is, in your mind, the, the source of the disconnect between the perception and the reality of the technical openness of the platform? Hmm. Yeah, so I, mean, I actually hear two different questions there. One is, you know, um, is, the, is the LMS closed and bad, and, you know, is that perception based on reality? But also, uh, you know, in terms of openness and capabilities beyond the more, as, as you said before, sir, the more rigid, uh, you know, intentions of an LMS, where else can we go with that? Um, and I've been in ed tech long enough that I've both believed the LMS is terrible and believed that it's awesome, and, and usually my answer is like, well, it depends on what you want to accomplish, right? Um, I certainly don't believe that 
the, the LMS as technology reflects much more than one, the original designer's intent for it, their beliefs and values that they embed into it, but also too, right, the demands and the needs of the users, the, the people who make use of it. I think, um, you know, it's, it's certainly not true that the LMS is viewed broadly as being a bad thing or else people wouldn't be using it and paying money for it, right? Um, but on the other hand, the limitations of the LMS are real. And th a lot of those are deliberate on purpose. Um, so what we try to do is both deliver the, the core tools and capabilities that you know, most users want, but then open up avenues uh, for people to do more, try more with it. I, I honestly don't think though that, well, I actually think it will be a while before people look at educational technology in general as this cornucopia of awesomeness that they can pick and choose from. That's the vision. The vision is that you know, the, the LMS will be sort of the, the hub, the framework perhaps, for this cornucopia of beautifully interoperating and um, you know, seamlessly exchanging data, uh, tools and services from the open web, from the ed tech community, you know, wherever. We're a long ways from that still, but we're, we're moving in the right direction. So you know, setting expectations appropriately is probably the, the right approach. And, and looking at real examples of where we are being successful in terms of integrating uh, outside technologies. Well, let's give a big round of applause for Jared. Thank you. Thank you.